Could you use a few new ideas to reinvigorate the energy and productivity in your classroom? Well, in this episode, you will get lots of new ideas and suggestions for authentically engaging your students in their language learning. I'm joined by two teachers in New York, Spanish teacher Wendy Mercado and French teacher Valerie Greer. Lots to learn about, so let's jump in. Are you a language teacher looking for some reassurance that what you're doing in the classroom is on the right track? Or maybe you're looking for some ways to teach even more effectively. If you're one or the other or somewhere in between, you've landed in the right place. This is the World Language Classroom Podcast with your host, me, Joshua Cabral. You're about to get tips, tools, and resources so that your students continue to rise in proficiency and communicate with confidence. Let's jump in. Vamos, allons-y. Hello, my friends. Bonjour, mes amis. Hola, mis amigos. Welcome to the World Language Classroom podcast. I am Joshua Cabral, and thank you for being here. You are in for a treat with this episode. I know that I say every week, you're such a great teacher for being here and listening, but what you're listening to today, you're going to go back into your classroom with so many things to do. So I just, I don't even want to spend too much time saying thank you for being here because I really want to jump into today's topic. But yes, thank you for being here. But our topic today is about engaging activities in the language classroom. Joining me today are uh, Valérie Greer and Wendy Mercado. Valérie is a French teacher and Wendy is a Spanish teacher and they are on Long Island. And I met them, I'm guessing somewhere around seven or eight years ago, I attended one of their workshops at, I believe, a NYSEFELT event, which is the New York State Association for Language Teachers. And I was enthralled and I wanted to do every single activity that they were showing in my classroom. I remember it was over the summer. And I was bummed that I wasn't going to be teaching for about another six weeks because it was at a summer institute. And I was like, ah, but I want to be doing it right away. So when I was looking to have conversations to bring onto the podcast for this year, I had to definitely reach out to Valerie and to Wendy. As I said, they're on Long Island and they have both been teaching for 25 years and they've actually been teaching for those 25 years together in the same school, and that's been the bulk of their teaching career. You may have seen them presenting at various NYSEFELT events, like their conferences and their institutes, and they've also won the best of NYSEFELT, which put them on to NECTFUL, where they were the best workshop at NECTFUL as well, the Northeast Conference, and they're also regularly seen at Actful as well. These are just amazing presenters, and there's a reason why they are sought after and teachers are looking to them. So that's my spiel on who they are. And so Valerie and Wendy, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Joshua. We're so honored to be here. We're very <laughs> excited to be here. Thank yeah. you. I would I'd be very interested to hear, before we jump into our engaging activities for the classroom, I would like to hear about this 25-year working relationship. So, Wendy, what's that been all about for you? Well, it's funny because Valerie and I have very similar stories. We actually are both heritage speakers of our respective languages that we teach. We both went to SUNY Stony Brook, and we started there both as chemistry majors. And then organic chemistry came around, and we were like, hmm, maybe this isn't for us. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I could speak for Valerie when I could say we, we were taking our respective heritage language classes for fun, and we realized, why are we not making this our major? Mm -hmm. And it was so funny that we never met until we both landed our jobs at Bayshore, even though we had we were both born in the same school, we had started as the same major. Mm -hmm. So we do, it's just funny that we have this parallel life, so to speak. But I started at Bayshore in September of 98. Valerie came on a few months later. We had the same lunch period. We hit it off right away. And we started working on our master's together. We graduated together. And just, you know, Valerie left for a couple of years. She went to the high school. But we kept our friendship. We kept working together very closely. And even though we teach different languages, we've always been able to share activities and share ideas. So that's been great. We always had that great relationship. She came back to the middle school and we were bouncing to a lot of conferences together. And one year over dinner, we were just like, 
we should present this would be fun. And that's what started all of this. So you had this incredible working relationship that you were able to bring to the conference world and presentations. And I remember just seeing right away. So I've seen you present a number of times, but I remember that first time thinking, wow, they're best friends. It was like, they, they are best friends. I was just sort of thinking what I would do to have a colleague that I had that working relationship with. Right? Yeah, I, I was a bridesmaid in her wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Valerie, anything to, to add into that working relationship from over the years? Well, I, I do have to say that our best ideas come on our road trips. We go to conferences, we find an idea, we say, we like that, but we can make it better. We need to put mm-hmm. our own twist on it. And we've come up with most of our best ideas literally in the car, driving upstate, driving to Baltimore, driving to Boston, wherever we go. And we always are working together. It doesn't matter that she teaches Spanish and I teach French. And even the same activities we do, we have our different twists on it. Mm-hmm. It's all about collaboration and yeah. just talking and, and bouncing ideas off of each other. I think that's what makes your activities and your suggestions so applicable to so many teachers is you're not two teachers of the same level, same language, that it only works there. You find ways to make them applicable to multiple languages, and that's that's huge. So I would like to start to get into this conversation about our engaging activities. I always like to start by making sure we understand the words we're using, because we're a profession, particularly language teachers, there's so many buzzwords, you know, I just want to make sure that what we're saying, like when we say comprehensible input, what do we mean, you know, but when we're talking about engaging activities, I would like to know your lens before we talk about these activities, I'd like to know your lens about what are those essential benefits of authentic engagement, and really building on that excitement in the language classroom. Wendy, why don't you start with that? Well, for me, it's essential to keep the students engaged, right? We want them to have fun. We want them to be excited. We want them to come, but want to come to class. Because to me, that's what's going to keep them not only learning, but it's going to keep them in our program. It really gives them an opportunity to learn outside of Bayshore, right? A lot of our students don't have that opportunity. So we open their worlds, we open their minds, we get them excited, we get them wanting to come to class, we get them wanting to stay in our program. We just want to create lifelong learners, global citizens, and by being able to make our classes authentically engaging and exciting for our students each and every day, it really helps create that environment. Mm -hmm. That advocacy piece is so important. When I was putting together the questions I wanted to ask you about that, I hadn't even thought about that advocacy piece. I'm always so focused on the acquisition, the language acquisition and the learning, but that piece of wanting students to stay and giving them a reason to stay that, you know, we always want to think, oh, they love culture and language and all that. But sometimes they're 13, (laughs) sometimes they're 12, and or they're 15, and they have better things to do. And But when we want to advocate for our programs and keep our students in our programs, that excitement is huge there, right? Valerie, anything else you'd like to add into the excitement in the classroom and engaging activities? Humans by nature, we learn by doing. Little kids learn through play. If you learn to be a carpenter, you learn by practicing. It's the same thing with learning a language. You have to do it. So that's why we try to come up with activities where they can use the language in a fun way that makes them excited about speaking in the target language. And Mm -hmm. as far as the advocacy piece goes, you know, our French program has grown tremendously. I know a lot of schools are losing their French programs and ours just keeps growing to the point where we have to turn kids away because there's not enough teachers to teach all the students. And a lot of it is because we have now started going into the sixth grade classrooms and we've been doing little mini presentations to help kids pick a language and we're all doing fun things. They're excited to learn a language. Mm -hmm. You know, they're excited to try Chinese, to try Latin, to try French, to try Spanish, because we're playing the games. We're making the effort to just keep that spark alive. Excellent. That is wonderful news to hear about your advocacy efforts and retaining students into the program and having the program grow, because we do hear so much, particularly about French programs. So that that is just wonderful to hear. So 
just to keep you on the line a little bit more on this question here, Valerie, I want to take this word game because a lot of times when we talk about our activities and what we're doing in the classroom, we're using the word game. And when we hear that word or activity, it can sometimes seem like it's useful for brain breaks, which have their use, absolutely. Or games are to just have some fun with the language. But I think that there are many opportunities to go beyond just fun and games when it comes to these activities. So I would like you to speak to how we are also addressing skill development and even national and state standards, but through these types of games, just so we don't see them as, you know, fun and games. You're right. The word fun usually has a negative connotation in the classroom. So unfortunate, but (laughs) yes. (laughs) But who says if they're having fun, they can't be learning. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I like to call everything a game in quotation marks, even if it's not a game. I like to trick my students into thinking all they're doing is playing games all the time when they're really not. And we are addressing the standards. I mean, you know, there's that, that saying, if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And that's the approach I like to take with my classes. They come in and they're like, this is my favorite class a day. I love French class. This class is so fun. You're the only one who plays games. But at the end of the day, when they're being assessed, they can do it because they're learning. They're using the target language. They, they we're lowering that effective filter, mm-hmm. all with meeting the standards. So that whole idea, that really brings it down to if you are enjoying what you're doing, it won't feel like work. And I think that's a challenge that we meet in education in general, and particularly now coming out of the pandemic and having students learn to be students again, that if they're just being students and they feel like it's work, it's not going to be enjoyable. They're not going to keep at it. So I really appreciate that lens that there's a lot of learning going on and it's fun and it doesn't have to be a dichotomy one or the other. Okay, so now let's talk about what everybody wants to hear on this episode, the fun and engaging and useful and standards-based activities, all of that stuff that we can do in our classroom. And a lot of times when we are sharing ideas on the podcast, I like to suggest to listeners that as they're hearing different activities, that they put it in like one of four buckets. Bucket one is I could do that tomorrow because what happens is they hear of lots of good activities. I'm speaking for myself. I'll hear all these activities and I'll want to do them all tomorrow. And you just can't. I'm going to listen and I'm going to think, okay, there's one I can try tomorrow. And then there's another bucket that's for next week because it might take a little more prep. And then I have another bucket where I hear an activity and it's going to go great for the fill in the blank unit. Maybe not for tomorrow, maybe not for next week. Oh, but when I do that unit, I'm going to do that activity. And then the fourth bucket is, wow, that needs a little more time. Maybe I'll get to it next year. I just want to make sure that as everyone's listening, you're going to hear great stuff, but not to feel like you got to do it all tomorrow. So there's the tomorrow bucket, there's the next week the next unit, and next year. Okay, so I want to start by looking at this idea of technology and not technology. And Wendy, if you don't mind, if you would just say a couple of words about where we were with technology and the pandemic and where we are with technology in the classroom now. What's that looking like for you? Well, I will tell you that I had a full year of virtual teaching completely online. The last few weeks of school, I had one hybrid class. But after being in front of that computer from March of 2020 mm-hmm. till June of you know 2021, I'm, I'm kind of shocked. You know, I, I, I enjoy the, having access to the technology that we have now. I definitely use it on a regular basis, but I don't want to be in front of that computer all the time. And I don't think my students, I don't think they want to be either. And I don't think they should be. So I kind of take it back a little bit you know, prior to the pandemic, it was, can we sign out the cart of Chromebooks or the cart of iPads? If we were lucky to get it, we could, you know, do a technology-based lesson. Yay. Everybody was all excited about it. Now I, I'm, I'm happier to take it back to the basics and do more hands-on activities that aren't necessarily technology-based. Mm-hmm. I just feel like the students need time away from the screens a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I do too. I think I have a healthy mix going mm-hmm. in right now. 
Excellent. So if we start with our engaging activities for students, let's start by looking at a couple of technology pieces, and then we'll put it aside and we'll focus on, because there are teachers that are still using a lot of technology in their classrooms. So what are some activities that involve technology that have been successfully engaging for you? I will share one activity that I heard about at an Axel conference. It's called Iron Chef. So I don't know if you're familiar with the show. I am, yes. So they get out there, these two chefs to duel, and right, they have their secret ingredient. Right, that's not such a secret because it's always based on whatever unit we're working on. But I always keep it a secret. And that morning, I'm like, "Oh, today's Iron Chef." I think they like to groan and moan just to be funny, but they have such a good time with it. So it'll be whatever the you know the surprise ingredient is, whatever the topic is that we're doing. For example, with the eighth graders, I just did Mi Casa Ideal, right, my dream home. And what I do is I set up a Google Slides, and I share it with my students, and they're all editors. And I assign every student a slide, and I give them usually between between 10 and 12 minutes to create their slide. And on their slide, they don't have words. They just have a picture of what their dream house would be, um, their favorite room, a couple of things they they would like in their house. And then I have every student come up and do a very short oral presentation and tell the class about their casa ideal, about their ideal home. And some of the students really get an opportunity to showcase their creativity. They like to get silly. They tell me that they live in a pineapple under the sea or they tell me that they live on the moon. But it is such a fun and engaging activity for presentational speaking. And it really gives me an opportunity to build relationships. So they get to learn about each other. I get to learn about them. And we have so much fun. Grading wise, it's super easy. I have a little uh, rubric that I'm checking off as they're presenting. So by the end of the period, everybody has presented. All the grades are done and it's great. Mm -hmm. But it has given me the opportunity to get to know my students, to hear them use the vocabulary in a fun way, in context. And they feel so successful by the end of that activity because when we first start doing it, they're they're kind of afraid. They're a little bit stressed. They're like, oh, can, can we do this? And I'm like, of course you can. Think about, you know, the structures and the pieces that you've learned, put them all together. And they have such a good time. They're laughing at everybody. They cheer each other on. And it's such a great relationship builder. And it uses technology. Mm-hmm. They're doing presentational speaking. So it brings together so many nice things and you know, this little, this one assignment, we just have such a great time with it. You refer to it as presentational speaking, that sort of activity. But do you also see that for those students listening, it's also an interpretive listening activity? So you have it on there, that side? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can definitely take it a step further and have them, you know, comment either Mm -hmm. orally or written probably Mm -hmm. on what they've heard, you know, what was their favorite ideal home that they saw, things of that nature. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Excellent. So any other ideas involving technology that we can share? One of my favorite websites is Flippity, Mm -hmm. Flippity.net. I feel like you can do so much with that. It's just so easy to use and how it works with Google. I personally like the scavenger hunt. That's kind of like a breakout. I -hmm. think that one is fun. I know Valerie, you use it a lot too. I do. They have a Flippity bingo. Everything's Mm -hmm. free on Flippity. Just go to Flippity.net and it's two Ps and They have a lot of different activities and they're always bringing new things in there. So flippity bingo, you could just put in your words and your answer. So for instance, I did family and I use circumlocution like um, la mère de ma mère et ma. So I would say that and then they would have to find grand mère. And -hmm. what flippity bingo does is it generates a different bingo board for every single student in the class. Mm -hmm. And they click on it and they put little bingo chips on it. Now, if you want to go a different route with it, there's an option to also print 30 different bingo boards for your class if you want to do the paper route. Mm -hmm. There's also Flipperty Jeopardy where you can make, or Flipperty Quiz Show, I think it's called, Mm -hmm. where you can make like a Jeopardy board and it keeps score for you and eliminates the different topics. They have a a Wordle, like a Flippity Wordle. Mm -hmm. They have so, there's so much on that website. It's free. And I would say that there's high tech, low tech and no tech options all Mm -hmm. in that one website. When they're doing that bingo through Flippity, uh, which I haven't used, so I have to ask some questions. I'm thinking this is one of those things. It's either tomorrow or next week. So I'm getting my questions in now. Are students, individual students in the class getting a virtual bingo board? So are they all sort of signing on to the same? Talk me through that. What does that look like for students? What I... What you do, it, it literally takes five minutes to set up. Mm-hmm. You follow the template. It gives you directions. 
and then it gives you a link to the board. So, you know, it's a Flippity website. You have to make sure you always publish to the site. You have to follow directions to a T. And then the link, what I usually do is I put it into my LMS. We use Google Classroom. And then the kids will click on the link and it generates a different virtual board for each student in the class. You really have to be a one-to-one district. Mm -hmm. If you're not a one-to-one district, that's not going to work. And then you would want to go the paper route where it will print out 30 different boards for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're all basically virtually playing together through that link. Yes. And then they, Uh. they click the word and it puts a bingo chip. And then when they get a bingo, you can keep going or you can have them clear the board or they could shuffle their board and have the words in different spots. So there's a lot of options. And Mm -hmm. for middle schoolers who have a hard time comprehending things at times, this is really easy for them and they always get it on the first shot. Okay. Great. We've gotten through one activity and my tomorrow bucket is already full. Okay. (laughs) So do we want to move on to beyond technology or anything more you want to share about technology? I think we can go beyond technology. Okay. Let's take advantage of the fact that we are in person, face-to-face for the most part, and what we can be doing there. So uh, let's fill our, our buckets with some engaging activities for our students. So who would like to take the next one? I can give you a tomorrow activity. Uh, oh, oh, a tomorrow activity, even though my, my bucket's already full, but okay, it runneth over. Let's it's gonna, go. It will. So <clears throat> I got this activity on TikTok. It's called Vindictive. So it's amazing what you'll learn on TikTok. <laughs> so this is a game that you can play at the end of the period. It's no prep. It's really good for a filler if you have a few minutes left in class. Um, I ended up doing it for my observation a few weeks ago and my director loved it. So the idea of the game is that everyone in the class stands up. Every single person stands up. And then you will ask a question and then you can pick on someone who volunteers. If they get the question correct, they get to choose three people to get out. And those three people have to sit down. If they get the question incorrect, that student must sit down. Now you're thinking, well, what about the people sitting down? They can get back in the game. So if a person sitting down raises their hand to answer a question and they get it correct, they stand up and can get two people out. And the game proceeds until there's only one person left in the game. So they get very vindictive and they start forming alliances and targeting each other. And it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. So can you talk about some of the themes, vocabulary structures you've used with that particular activity? Well, for my observation, I was doing family. So mm-hmm. I was doing la mère de ma mère et ma. You could just ask regular questions, whatever. Mm-hmm. Anything that you would put if you were playing a Jeopardy game mm-hmm. or a quiz show game, any of those questions you could ask. Circumlocution. I love mm-hmm. circumlocution and have them answer the questions. You could really do it with anything right? where okay. you would question and answer the kids. And it's zero prep. All right. So vindictive sounds very vindictive. It is very vindictive. (laughs) Let's continue down to some other activities. Um, One of my favorite activities, actually, I have a class. They're so funny. They ask to play this every single day. Scategories. Mm -hmm. And you want to talk about a zero prep game. So for scategories, I give them exactly that, some categories. And the students, the first couple times we play, you know, I just tell them, for example, we did it today because this one class has been driving me crazy. And we're in the house and home unit. And so I said... Give me a chore. Uh, Give me a space in the home. I said, give me something that you have in your bedroom. And the other one was just give me a color. I threw that one in. And so what you do after after they all have their answers written down, and I tell them, don't look at anybody else's paper. When you're done writing, put your writing instrument down, pick up your paper and stand up. They all do that. I say, okay, what chore did you choose? Somebody says, take out the trash. Did anybody else write, take out the trash? If they did, they sit down, they're out. And you keep going. And when you get original answers, those are the students that get points. It's so funny because the, the next few times we play, they all, they're all thinking so hard to try to come up with that original answer. Today we were playing, and they were all trying to come up with the most like obscure things that they could put together. And one student said, take out the trash. And other kids like, take out the trash. Ha ha. Everybody's going to have that. Well, lo and behold, nobody had to take out the trash. So that student got his point. He was so excited. He got his point. You know, and they were all just like, we're sitting here thinking so hard. He wrote, take out the trash. I said, well. You know, but that one's a fun one that could be as short or as long as you want it to be. But some other ones that that my students really like. Oh, I got an email from the teacher in on, in the classroom under me because I was too loud. 
I was playing a game, <laughs> Pass It Up. I learned it from La Maestra Loca. Mm -hmm. So we did that with prepositional phrases and different vocabulary with pictures. So I have my students sit in rows. The last person in the row has a bunch of pictures. And I read a sentence. And they need to, this, that student needs to find the picture that matches that sentence. And they pass it up the row. So everybody's checking their answer. And the first person to stick it to my magnetic board correctly. And they rotate. And they sit back down. That team gets a point. They got so into that. Um, that they knocked the desk over and I got an email about my class being too loud for that one. So running dictation where the students can go out into the hallway, they read a sentence, they bring it back to their group, they're all writing it down. And then usually I have an extension to that where I'll have them put the sentences, either match a question to the answer, or I'll have them put the sentences in chronological order. Those are a lot of fun. Anything that they can do that's active, like speed. Oh my goodness. The students love speed. So a bunch of cards with pictures and you have them playing two students against each other mm -hmm. and you say a vocabulary word or a circumlocution, you describe something and the first student to touch the card, you know, they get it. They get, they get so excited. They I have to always remind them to put a finger and not slap the card and slap each other because mm -hmm. that can get a little unruly. Anything that's like a competition, they have a lot of fun with. Right. I was going to say speed as well, but <laughs> another one we like, and I, I do want to mention that a lot of these games we're talking about, we do have descriptions on how to play them on our website, and we do have some downloadable options for you as well, for free, everything's free. We do play a game called Balloon Pop, and we have balloons on our website that you can print so you don't have to work to create them. So basically you make balloons, I usually have about six, I want to say six different colors because I have six different rows in my class. And what I suggest is you print the balloons on cardstock, different colors, laminate them, cut them. And I'm going to say it's tedious. Cutting those balloons are tedious, but then you have them forever. I like to put little magnets on the back and then I put them on my whiteboard and each row is a different color. And again, the same premise is vindictive, a Jeopardy game, a quiz show. It's a question and answer. And you ask a team a question. If they get it correct, they have the option to pop the balloon from another team. We got this idea from math teachers and they were using real balloons and we're like, mm, mm, no, mm. we're just going to use paper balloons. <laughs> so then we take the balloon down and then they start targeting each other. Now, let's say you're running low on balloons. If you get it right, you can reinflate one of your balloons. So no team is out because they have no balloons left and every team is always able to play. And then at the and end, how many did they start with? Um, I want to say I have about 10 per team. And you oh, can do okay. as many as you want. Okay, like, but it's not one. No. Like once no. It's, it's out. Okay. It's like 10. I, I think I have about 10 per color. Oh, okay. So, you know, and then they'll be like, red, red. Oh, you popped red. I'm going after you now because you popped our balloon. And <laughs> yeah, it's they, they get really crazy. But we love it. We love that competition. And it's like, a, I like to call it an organized chaos. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the best term for it, organized yeah, type of yes. I personally love breakout activities. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of the boxes, but I also like went to the store and bought a cheap toolbox and a bunch of locks and made my own as well. I put the students into groups. They get a variety of tasks and, you know, each task gives them a combination to a lock. They love that. Anything that they can do with their hands, mm -hmm. they get so excited about. Mm -hmm. So breakout boxes for me are a lot of fun. And you can also do those fully digitally as well. You can mm -hmm. do them with Google Forms. I did that the year that I taught virtually. We What we've discovered is that math activities and language activities, they work. Mm -hmm. And we've learned a lot from math teachers and the math teachers have learned a lot from us. We collaborate a lot with the math teachers in our in our building because I don't know why it trans math translates to language somehow. Mm -hmm. So around the classroom is a great reading activity. And you put cards around the room. So for instance, I just did this yesterday. I was doing clothing and I put different celebrities around the room. So let's say I had a picture of Ed Sheeran and then I would describe what someone is wearing, but the picture and the description don't match. That's the key. So they're reading the description and they have to now look around the room to see which person is being described. And then they have to write the name of that person down and then they have to walk to that card next. So they're literally going around the classroom. You can do this with many different activities. I've done it with math problems for numbers. I've done it with family. I've done it with foods, describing different foods. What else have you done it with, Wendy? I've done it with stories, questions and answers from the stories, reading comprehension. 
I've done it with a date, you know, simple vocabulary and picture to start at the novice low. So I have a question going back to the breakout rooms. This is something I have been wanting to try. So I have questions about, I've never talked to a teacher who's done them. So this is my opportunity. Uh, So what you do in the breakout rooms and they're in small groups, right? Where they're trying to figure out the, they're completing some sort of task. Absolutely. And then they get a code. Maybe it's a letter, number, combination, whatever the lock is, right? Exactly. So say I'm in a group. And we had some sort of task and do we then bring it to you and you verify that it's correct and then you give us the code? So I've learned that you can do basically any type of activity. You can do a crossword puzzle, a word search, really any type of sorting activity, anything that gives you some sort of answer. For example, I have locks that are a combination, right? So they have three combinations. So you could do anything almost like a fill in the blank question, right? An answer. And then each letter has like a number and then you have them choose certain letters and that those are your codes. But I have several boxes. So I'll put my students in groups of like four because I went out like a crazy person and bought toolboxes, but I also have a bunch of the actual breakout EDU boxes. Mm -hmm. Each group gets their own box with their set of locks. And so they get so excited to be able to come up to their box and try to work on their own locks. So there are a variety of different locks. There's the combination one, there's a three-digit one, there's a four-digit one, there are letter locks. Mm -hmm. Those are really cool. And there's directional locks. So that's a lot of fun when I'll give them a map and I tell them they have to find different things within the map. I've done it with El Zoológico de Chapultepec. And I have them go to different animals and they look at a map and they they find the different places and that's the the combination to the directional lock. Mm -hmm. So they get to, as a group, decide what order they're going to do the puzzles in. They can decide if they want to divide and conquer. Maybe two of them will work on one puzzle and two will work on another. And then they help each other with the answers. And they get to come up. I usually assign one person to be the person that comes to open the locks. Or I tell Mm -hmm. them, you can only have one person per group come up at a time. Mm -hmm. And I do have all the boxes up at the front of the room so I can kind of supervise Mm -hmm. what's going on. But every activity comes up with a different combination to whatever designated lock. There's a lot of prep work involved. I'm not going to lie. Mm -hmm. But they have so much fun with that whole concept of being able to open these locks with their hands, do everything themselves. And then they get to see whatever the prize is, which is usually like some stickers or pencils or maybe some candy. It's nothing crazy, Mm -hmm. but they get so excited. And it's a great collaborative activity. So the verification of having done the task or activity correctly is that the lock opens. And if it doesn't, they have to go back and see what they did and go in that way. Okay, now I understand it a little better. So you touched upon a little bit there, you just said that if they are able to open it, there's candy or something inside. So if we open that up more generally to all of these activities that we're doing in the classroom, do you offer incentives? each time you're doing these. So Valerie, can you talk us through what incentives look like in your classroom, particularly when involved in these types of games and activities? My incentive is something that I created called Madame Money. It's Mm -hmm. my class money system. And I I made money and it has my face on it. And I hand it out to kids and I write the amount on the back. I always hand it out in, in fives. So I'll write like five or 10 or whatever on the back. Madam money is the key to everything in my class. If they want to go to the bathroom, they have to pay me 10 madam money. And they have to ask me in French. So let me tell you, not a lot of kids are asking on the bathroom. If they want to go get a drink of water, they ask me in French, 10 madam money. If they want a pen or a pencil, they can buy one for me for 10 madam money. They get to keep it. And I'm going to be honest, these are the pens and pencils that I collect off the floor that are all over my classroom Mm -hmm. at the end of the day. It's resale. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if they lose a worksheet, that's five mana money. And I only charge for that because they have free access to everything on my website because I upload all of my work to my website. So they always have access to that. A hundred mana money, they can buy a homework pass or get five bonus points on a test or quiz. 25 mana money, money to go to their locker. And then I charge them if they say the word shut up in English, Mm -hmm. because I do not allow that word in my class. Mm -hmm. And once I eliminated that word from my class, classroom management became a breeze because kids say it so much, they don't realize it. So now it's a big thing. And it's funny, the other day, just yesterday, they heard a kid across the hall say shut up in their class and their whole kid, they were taking a test. Mm -hmm. The whole class, their head snapped up and looked at me and they're like, Madam Greer, 
<laughs> you need to go charge them 10 mana money. They just <laughs> said, shut up. <laughs> so it's a big thing. And I use it for incentives. If they turn in projects early, these are their words for their games. And then I have the kids that hoard it. And they're like, I have a thousand mana money. And I don't know what it is about this money. It's free to make. And the kids mm -hmm. absolutely love it. And they go wild over it. And you consistently reward the students with that madame money each time you're doing the, these individual activities. Yes. And I know some people are going to think, well, what if they don't have money and they have to go to the bathroom? I have an IOU list. So if you don't have money, okay. But there's a fee for going to my IOU list and I charge double. So now 10 madame money is 20. And all of a sudden they find their 10 madame money that they claimed they didn't have. And I write their name, the date, what it was. And then I'll say, oh, you're in debt. You just won five marami. I'll remove that from your debt. So they know I'm keeping track of that. It's a whole system. Do you have any incentives that you use in your classroom, Wendy? I will admit that I'm not nearly as organized as Valerie with her system. <laughs> I'm, I am in awe of her system. It doesn't work for me. I don't know what it is about my students and stickers. They love stickers. What it is about a sticker, I'm like, you get a sticker. And you get a sticker. They get so excited. Can I have a sticker? Do you have bigger stickers? The one This year I have like big ribbon ones that say tu eres especial or um, tu eres el campeón, I think it says. And they, when I busted those out, oh my goodness, you would think I was giving out cash. They were so excited to get these big stickers. So I go with stickers every now and then I'll be like, oh, que tengo en el armario, you know, algo especial. And they're all like, oh, what do you have? And I'll pull out a pencil. They're all excited. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it doesn't take much to get the students excited. I think for me, it's a lot of like the drama. Mm -hmm. like, you know, what do I have today? What's in this bag today? And they're just like enthralled by these little stickers or whatever silly things I have in there. I change it up. Today I gave out some Jolly Ranchers, which which technically we're not supposed to give out. But I was like, you know what? They've been great. They've been asking for this game for so long. They they work so diligently so that we can mm -hmm. make sure that we had plenty of time to do it. Mm -hmm. Here are some Jolly Ranchers. Knock yourself out, kid. I'm just excited that they're so excited. Mm -hmm. And so whatever whatever I can give them, you know, as silly little tokens. But the ones, the stickers just crack me up because I have kids that they, they like collect them and they want to fill up their folder with them. Those are the moments when we who choose to spend our days with middle school students are reminded of the good times of spending our time with middle school students, you know, because not every student is going to be excited about that. But I often will tell parents that I've never seen a kid more excited than when you get out the dry erase boards and the markers. Oh, that yeah. is like they have struck goal. I'll tell parents sometimes, I know their birthday is coming up and they're asking for an iPad. Go to the dollar store and get a dry erase board. <laughs> they will be just as happy. I guarantee you. <laughs> Absolutely. It really is funny to see how excited they get over things like that. Right. So I'm feeling incredibly inspired by so many of these activities. My buckets are like running over with all the things I want to try and do in the classroom. And I would like to know where you both continue to pull all of your inspiration from in your classroom. So Valerie, where are you pulling your inspiration from? I'll tell you a few blogs. I really love the frenchcorner.net. That's Samantha Decker. She's from Saratoga Springs, New York. She has really great ideas. And I really go to her website all the time for ideas. I also love Senorita Spanish. And I'm not a Spanish teacher, mm -hmm. but I am a big fan of hers. And I love her blog and her YouTube channel. And I follow her on Instagram. She has such great ideas all the time. And honestly, that's, that's Ashley Mickelson, correct? Yes. 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 I'm a big fan can, of hers. Can I tell you something very funny about Ashley Mickelson? Mm -hmm. In one hour, we're doing a podcast interview. And I, I can't wait to tell her that you just said that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually saw that when you put it on Instagram and I reached out to her. I was like, I'm so, I'm fangirling right now. I, I love her. I also love um, Madame R's French Resources. She has a really good blog. And I am obsessed with Pocket Full of Primary, which is a YouTube channel not related to world language, but I have gotten a lot of really good ideas from her mm -hmm. as well. And she was an elementary teacher. Yeah. So those are my favorite go to's. Yeah. How about you, Wendy? Where's that inspiration coming from? Well, I mean, I just start. I just tried shipwreck for the first time this week from you, and I had <laughs> the kids loved it. I loved it. I thought it was awesome. The comprehensible classroom, Martina Bax, we really like La Maestra Loca, Annabelle Williams. She's awesome. She's hilarious. TikTok. I'm finding a lot of things on TikTok, Facebook, Spanish teachers in the U.S., and you know, different pages like that. There's just so much out there to get inspired by and just be able to take ideas and like you said, hone them and make them work for your classroom and, mm -hmm. you know, 
you have to know your audience, right? So what can, you know, what can inspire your students and get them excited? Yeah. So I just try to pick from a, a bunch of different places, but it's funny that TikTok has really kind of made my list. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Some teachers are getting TikTok famous right now. It's pretty incredible, right? Okay, well, thank you for sharing out your inspiration. So this is the part of our conversation where I like to pull the teacher curtain back a little bit and get to know Valérie and Wendy a little better by playing my little game of this or that. You up for it? Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. I'm going to start with you, Valerie, with this question. If you are attending a party, or if you're at a party, is it more likely that you're a guest or did you plan the thing? I'm a guest. <laughs> okay. Not a I'm, party I'm, planner. <laughs> I'm extremely introverted. I'm highly okay. introverted. Oh, okay. So does that mean, Wendy, that you planned the party or Probably, you? Probably, yes. Oh. <laughs> Wendy's Batman and I'm Robin, basically. Yes. <laughs> this is another one of those like yin and yang working relationships, right? So yes, yeah, because you need the person who's going to plan and the other one. Okay. Now the next one, I'll start with you, Wendy. You're going on a trip. And you have to do some packing for it. Are you going to pack lightly or do you throw everything in? Valerie's laughing because she knows. I take everything and then some. Oh, wow. Especially the snacks. <laughs> oh, okay. And is that funny for you, Valerie, because you're the opposite or are you kind of like that as well? I'm the same way. And her overpacking helped out one year when we were presenting in Baltimore and my suitcase was lost and she had to lend me her clothes <laughs> for a presentation. Because she had seven days worth for the three-day conference? And she had extra brand new pajamas that she lent me. <laughs> As well. <laughs> okay. And the last one, Valerie, I'll start with you on this one. When it comes to movies and music, do you have some old favorites that you go back to or do you like to find new stuff? Music, new stuff. I have the music taste of a 12 year old. Mm. So top 40 billboard. Once it's 41, I'm done with it. Movies. I'm going to be honest. I'm more of a reality TV person. Oh. Yeah. I'm a reality TV junkie. Okay. So what are you watching these days? Everything. All the real housewives, 90 Day Fiance, A Love is Blind, you name it, I watch uh -oh. it. Bravo, Peacock and Discovery Plus. Those are my go-tos. <laughs> that is some insight that we <laughs> only got through the this and that section of this conversation. And how about you, Wendy? Oh, goodness. When it comes to music, I'm definitely more old school. It's actually funny because I got a text from my cousin a couple weeks ago and my oldest daughter's 20. She was with my, one of my youngest twins and apparently they were at a stoplight and my cousin pulled up next to them and they were rocking out to some old school Mariah Carey. Mm -hmm. And she, my cousin sent me a text like, you raised them well. So I thought that was <laughs> funny because 90s R&B and hip hop is where it's at in my house along with classic salsa music because that's what I grew up listening to with my father. Mm -hmm. The new stuff, eh, not so much. Yeah. But I definitely like to take it back to the 90s and 2000s. That's definitely my wheelhouse. Uh, as far as movies go, I, again, like some of the older stuff. And because I've been with middle schoolers so long, that's kind of where my attention span is at. So my mm -hmm. favorite movies like Clueless, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. But like Valerie, I'm also into the reality TV. I'm more of the Love is Blind, Married at First Sight. And like all the cooking shows, which my husband's like, you're always watching all these cooking shows. When are you going to cook some of this stuff? But I'm like, I prefer to watch it being cooked. I don't know. I'm not watching to learn. I'm watching to be entertained. There's a <laughs> big it, difference, right? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, if there are teachers that would like to visit your website, get in touch with you to learn more, whether it's to talk about reality TV or language teaching, um, how are we going to get in touch with you? So Valerie, what's the... What's the social media places and your website where you would like teachers to reach out? Um, well, Wendy and I are both on Twitter and I am at Madam Greer and Wendy is Senora and, Mercado. Uh, Senora Mercado, that's correct. And then our website is livenupyourlanguageclass.weebly.com and you will find most of the activities we talked about today and then some with detailed descriptions and downloadable materials all for free. I like the way that you have your website set up. There's low tech, there's mid tech. I forget the exact words you use. I think you say high tech, some tech and low tech, right? And then there's the absolutely no tech, right? So you can easily search with the different icons for going in there. 
before we say our goodbyes and get teachers out there to practice and use all these wonderful things you've shared, I like to leave listeners with some hearty advice about engagement in the classroom. So, Wendy, what could you offer advice-wise to teachers about this topic? Just have fun. That, let's just come to school and have fun. We mm -hmm. want to have fun with our students. We want to make our day enjoyable too. If my lesson is boring, I'm bored. I'm like the middle schoolers, you know. So just don't be afraid to have fun. Mm -hmm. Let your guard down and build relationships with the students. Find ways to get to know them, especially now after, you know, coming out of the pandemic. I think that's even more important than ever. Take the time to get to know your students. Find what they're interested in and find a way to incorporate that into your lesson. That's how you're going to help them. Mm -hmm. And that's how you're going to keep having fun with your students. Excellent. How about you, Valerie? Any advice to leave our listeners with? Yeah, I'm going to take it beyond the classroom. And I'm going to say that it's really important for teachers to join their local, state, and regional organizations because the connections that we have made through NECTFIL and ACTFIL and LILT and ISAFELT, we've made lifelong friends. We've learned so much. I think that right now with technology, it's so easy to say, well, I'll just read a blog. But going to these conferences in person, are, it's, it's really important. And it's really important to support these uh, organizations by joining and becoming a member. They're all nonprofit and they do a lot for the world language community. Mm -hmm. That's where we first connected yes. and met for the first time. So that's definitely a, a spark of inspiration and lifelong collegial friendships and relationships happen from there as well. I always appreciate the shout outs to the state language associations, particularly Nicefelt, which is an incredible organization. You're lucky to have that in your state of New York. So thank you so much for this opportunity to spend this time with both you, Valerie and Wendy, and to learn so much from you. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having us. Again, yeah. we're just, we were so excited to do this and we were just so honored. You're very honored. Thank you. We're big fans of yours. Oh, oh you're so kind. <laughs> thank you. What are your takeaways from that conversation with Wendy and Valerie? Hopefully you have a few more engaging activities to add to your teacher toolbox. Be sure to check out the show notes to connect with Wendy and Valerie. You'll also see the link to sign up for Talking Points, my weekly email newsletter with tips and resources for language teaching. There are also links to get in touch with me if you'd like to work together, either in person in your school or remotely. Talk to you soon. Bye for now. You've been listening to the World Language Classroom Podcast. Be sure to follow or subscribe wherever you're listening so you don't miss a single episode. Let's continue the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WL Classroom. You can also see over 250 blog posts about language teaching at, you guessed it, wlclassroom.com.